was in my life in touch with the top level performers. And since I stopped as well, I met many other athletes from other uh, sports, you know. And I tell them, tell me a little bit about uh, to find out where your motivation comes from. And honestly, all of them tell you only what they had lost and could have won. Hello, good evening, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us for this special Esquire Townhouse event with legendary manager Arsene Wenger. We're doing this event to coincide with the launch of your book. And just before we started, I said to you, did you enjoy writing the book? And your answer was? No. <laughs> <laughs> because I was used to look forward and not backwards. And uh, I arrived at my age at uh, thinking, I turned down many times the opportunity to write a book. And I thought I had a bit of time in front of me when I stopped to manage. And I thought, it's now or never. And why never? And uh, it was as well, especially family circumstances. I thought, I'll do it. At least people come after me. We know uh, a little bit uh, what the ancestors have done before then. <laughs> so you've ne you, you're not a fan of looking back? You've never looked back? No, I, I, I look back to analyze what I did right or wrong. But I don't look back at uh, a longer distance, you know. When I, I make a mistake, I try always to analyze why did I make a mistake. But uh, at my global life, I don't like to look back. It is what it is. You cannot change it anymore. But do you allow yourself to look back to enjoy events that have happened in the past? Because at the moment, you're saying you only look back to be self-critical. Yes. Uh, I think I carried through my life... Uh, the dissatisfaction of uh, everything I did. You never did enough, you're never happy enough, you never, you always want more. And uh, basically, life is about, for me, it was experiencing intense moments and uh, waiting for other intense moments. And in between, you work hard to get other intense moments, but I never look back globally because I knew uh, instinctively but uh, you need to find the meaning in life. My meaning was football. I was absolutely sure of that. And uh, life had the meaning if I am in football, you know. And uh, so I knew I was happy to lead the life I had. And uh, I thought I look later back, you know. And at some stage it catches you because uh, uh, age catches up and uh, you, you have to do it. The self-reflection and looking back on moments to be critical seems to be what drives a lot of people who perform to a high level in sport. AP McCoy, the jockey, who's a big Arsenal fan, has said to me several times, well, I may have got 4,000 winners, but I rode 18,000 horses, so I've got 14, so I've lost 14,000 times. But, but what strikes me uh, the most is I was in my life in touch with the top-level performers, and since I stopped as well, I met many other athletes from other uh, sports, you know, and I tell them, tell me a little bit about uh, to find out where your motivation comes from. And honestly, all of them tell you only what they had lost and could have won. Do you, has that come from your childhood? Has that come from when you were a player or do you think you, you are born with that? That's a mystery. Uh, I think uh, that's all where we have the same question about talent. Is it a genetical accident or is it, uh, did you develop your qualities through very early, early childhood? I don't know. The only thing I, uh, I can remember is the intensity of my desire, the intensity of my motivation. It certainly came from uh, my bistro where I was educated where the local football club had the headquarters and I heard only about football. So I must have thought that's the only thing that matters, basically. People talk about that. And uh, a bistro is a, as well a good education for a young boy to observe people, to detect why does he say that, and, you know. So it was a psychologic, good uh, education, psychologically. It gave you a real understanding of people from an early age. I try to understand when you're a boy, five, six, seven years old, you sit there and you listen to all the people uh, the whole day. 
you you try to understand uh, why they say that, why does he say that, and they speak about each other as well. But maybe it's a good uh, psychological education. Um, let's talk football then. Well, we might come back to, to childhood and, and France and Japan as well, where, where you coach. Um, and we're doing this event in the week of your first Arsenal game 24 years ago. What struck me when reading the book was actually, if you go back to the 1st of October, which is when you arrived at Arsenal, your, your quote is remarkable, really. You said, I've been preparing for years to live in London, to live only for this club, to give myself to it completely. And you, fe you felt that that first time. I felt that because uh, I was 47 years old. I had uh, 10 years uh, at the top level in France. I had two years in Japan. I knew I could live anywhere, you know. Uh, in my job, you have to take your luggage and go anywhere in the world. So it's a, a job for single people. And uh, I thought I had enough maturity, enough experience and uh, enough belief in myself as well, because I was manager of the year in France, uh, in Japan, and I, I, know I, I knew a little bit something about the game. And uh, that it was now or never for me, because I had uh, always admired the passion of the game in England. Because I feel, for me, England is the country of uh, the heart, you know. Passion for music, passion for sport, passion for big emotions. And I thought when I arrived the first time in England, I could understand why football has been created here. And uh, so I, I uh, wanted to stay in Japan unless I had an opportunity to come. Uh... Um, when you arrived at Arsenal, and, I, and I'm lucky enough to have worked with several of your players who were in that dressing room when you got there. When you walked into that dressing room for the first time, what did you make of them? Because I know from working with, say, Ian Wright and Martin Keown, <laughs> you're walking, <laughs> you're walking in, you're walking into a dressing room with very different personalities. Well, uh, there were, I must say, uh, the common thing: the only strong personalities, <laughs> you know, from David Seaman to Dixon, Winterburn, Adams, Boyd, Keown, and uh, and uh, Platt, and uh, you had only strong personalities, the Merson, and uh, you had only strong personalities in there. And they were all around 30. So that's a very sensitive for a manager because, you know, at some stage uh, you have to tell them, my friend, it's over. And that is always very difficult for a manager because uh, to survive when you have so many older players is difficult. And uh, I uh, raised a lot of skepticism because people thought, well, a French guy coming to English football was no history of foreign managers who have been successful what is going on there, and uh, I thought uh, I was ready to compromise, to adapt to local culture, that's uh, why I took Pat Rice as an assistant, because he knew well the Arsenal uh, way of life, and as well I was ready to fight for my ideas. So you have always to find the compromise between where you can give in and what you have to impose. And overall, generally, if you can convince a player that if, follow, if he follows what you want of him, he will be a better player, he does it. But uh, you can only do that if you win some games. So at the, start, at the start, you have to win football games. And that's what happened. And overall, these players were, I was, must say, they were better technically when I thought they were. Right. They were intelligent. And it was the old way of educating people in football, they were ready for a fight, you know. These guys, you could go anywhere with them. They were ready to go for it, you know. And uh, 96 is maybe the last period where the players from Liverpool did not move from Liverpool. The players from Manchester were Manchester for life. The players for Arsenal, of Arsenal were Arsenal players for life. Today, the mobility is much bigger. So the identification, Maybe this the club uh, is a bit smaller, you know, but when you were under threat, they were ready to fight for the club. Did you know immediately then that they were ready to embrace a different way of working or did you take your time, assess everything, 
and give it other, well, I don't know, I'll pick a six weeks, eight weeks, or, or do you go? No, I, I think uh, contrary to what people think, you have only three months. Right, dear. You have only three months. To if, win them over? To win them over. If after the first three months you didn't win, have not won them over, bye-bye, you, you go somewhere else, you know. So the first, to get what you want from people is a very short time. And uh, uh, after that, uh, I started with a lot of skepticism because I came with my glasses, look, <laughs> looked like a little teacher, you know, and people thought, who is this guy? What does he want to tell us? We are experienced English football players played in the national teams. And uh, so I was ready to face that. And uh, as well, uh, still changed my mind, my mode of... Uh, of what they did before, you know, I changed uh, what they did before with my own ideas, and uh, we were lucky because uh, I was lucky because he inherited a good team with good players who were as well fighters and had quality. Were they also skeptical? Because what I didn't realize, and I found out in the book, was in a game at the end of September against Borussia Mönchengladbach when you hadn't actually. Taken over, had you? That no, no, I was there as an observer. I right. came from Japan. Yes. Yeah, but you made a substitute. You went down to the dressing I, room at halftime. I half -time. took Tony Adams out of the game at halftime. Yeah, and we lost the game. Right. <laughs> so they must have thought this guy is completely mad. <laughs> and uh, I thought as well that's quite exciting. Uh, I, I went back to Japan, and uh, I thought. Certainly, uh, that was not the best of my decisions, you know. But, uh, and uh, that makes my job a bit harder. But uh, at some stage, that's what football is about. You have to make decisions. So how important was that first win on the 12th of October against Blackburn? It was important because I changed the, the preparation a lot, you know. I changed the diet a lot. I changed the way of... Uh, what were they singing on the coach, the players? They were singing, uh, we want our mask bars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I said to Gary Lewin uh, during a trip to the, to, the, uh, to the pitch, what are they chanting? He said, they sing, we want our mask bars back. <laughs> and uh, at half time, I think we won it up. I came in the dressing room and usually I had let prayers rest before I talk, but nobody said the word. And I said to Gary, what's wrong there? We are, we are winning. Why has nobody say a word? He said to me, they're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't give them anything? No. No, after they got used to it, you know, but uh, it's all uh, changed the habits of uh, preparation. And uh, after that, when the players, when you can convince somebody that he will be a better player, he's doing it, you know. And that's, uh, we are, uh, especially the modern manager, I think a modern manager is in a persuasive mode. You know, you deal with millionaires, they want to be treated like that. You have to convince people. You have to communicate today. You have to individualize uh, the communication and the training even more. That will, uh, I think, even go a step further. But uh, at the end of the day, if a player thinks he can be better, he will do it. Sean Dyche told me not, not that long ago, the Burnley manager, that it feels now, in the modern day, not, not back then, but in the modern day, that you are dealing with 25 chief executives of their own personal companies now, with each individual player. Does that resonate with you? It, it is true, yes. Uh, players is a little company now, but the manager as well, you know, the manager now comes in with a company that makes a contract with the, with the football club. And this company is his assistant, but they are in numbers. And uh, when he's finished, they go with him, and this company has a contract somewhere else. So, but as long as people meet their needs and they cooperate for the target of the club that needs to, to win, it's all right, but uh, it's an evolution. Before, the players could imagine, once they were at Arsenal, to move somewhere else. But today, that has changed. But as long as they commit completely, that is what is to be a real professional. It is, uh, once I sign my contract, I commit and I give my best. And life is about give and take, you know. 
So you have to be careful to balance that always. It's not only to take. Uh, it's give and take. Sometimes we forget uh, as well that life is about giving, you know. Uh, let's go back to, to after you'd taken over. Um, you say in the book as well that 14th of March 1998 at Old Trafford, Mark Overmars' goal, that you felt was the turning point for yes. you and this team. Can you explain why? It was the turning point because we had one game in hand, we're eight points behind Man United, but that victory instilled the belief in the team that we can win it. And once you have done that, you have put that into a team, they, they don't give up anymore, you know. They go for it. Once a team is convinced deeply that this is their chance, you can rely on them, they will go for it. And uh, that day was decisive on the belief side. So pre-match, were you thinking this could be decisive for this team? Or is it only with hindsight that you realise how decisive that was? No, when you get uh, into March, you make mathematics. Yeah. You, know? you know, if from eight points behind, uh, you go to 11 points behind, bye-bye. Manchester United will never give you uh, 11 points in from March to May. So, you know, that's a decider. And uh, uh, a draw left us a small chance. A win gave us a very good chance. And it was, uh, uh, that was, of course, vital on the day. What did you, can you remember what you said in the dressing room after that game? No, not really. I... Uh, so he must have said, uh, fantastic, let's, now let's go for it, really, do something like that, you know. But the, 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 but what I'm trying to get is these are all experienced players still, aren't they? There are, st there are still a very experienced side who have had very good careers. It's interesting that the belief came for some in that so late on. Because uh, you can have confidence in you and belief that you're a very good player, but not necessarily believe that the team is good enough to win the Premiership. And uh, uh, that you, you need uh, team moments where everybody feels, oh, not only I am know I am a good player, but around me we are good enough to win, you know. And that is in key moments of the season that you get that. Does the same uh, thinking work for you as work for the players? Did it give you belief all of a sudden? As well, but uh, I had quite a good uh, potential to believe that my team was good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you'd gone to Old Trafford and won. We got to Old Trafford and won, and uh, we won the championship and won the double that year. And that is a, certainly, that is a was a key moment for me as well in my career in England because uh, my full, first full season in charge, I won the double. When I was a little kid, we had to, we could only watch one game on television in black and white and it was the Wembley final. So imagine when I, I could not even dream that one day I would be a manager, but uh, imagine when I walked out the first day uh, or the final day uh, to play the FA Cup final at Wembley. And uh, so it was uh, exceptional. And that's what I wanted to say in my book, you know. Life can be bigger than your dream. And I speak to the children today who have difficult... Uh, it's very difficult. If you're young today, it's very difficult to see where will your life be. Yeah. So just want to say, be positive, have a passion and a dream. Maybe it will uh, come uh, alive at some stage. You're a firm believer. If you, you have a dream, you can achieve your dream. I would say, uh, you know, I made many people intervene uh, with a psychologist at the club to talk to them. Teams, uh, guys, every two or months, I invited somebody to talk to the players to what life is uh, special. Somebody who did something special. It was a guy who went uh, through the Pole North, a guy who was a dancer with Madonna, and they talked about their experience, a guy who was a world champion in skateboard. And, and uh, after I tried to analyze, and uh, where you come back to the dream, is this guy, sometimes they stopped to do what they did, 
to run after their dream, you know. And the, the four common things that came out there was, what is your dream? Go really for it. Two, uh, how can you make it happen? Three, get rid of all the negative thoughts that come automatically with it. Because uh, somewhere we'll say, I do it next year, or maybe I'm not, not good enough at the moment to do it. And four, commit completely. And all the people who did special things I met in my life, they had these four ingredients. So when, say, the skateboarder came to talk to the players, did you sit in and listen as well? Because one well, of the... Well, good, right. Because sometimes when reading the book, you it's football, 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 isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And, and you talk about you, looking out of your flat in Japan and, the, and you looked onto a, onto a wall. Yes. But that was a beautiful view if you'd won a game. Yes. And, and you had this amazing vista in Monaco, yeah. but that was a horrible view. Of the sea. You know, of, the, of, the, of the sea. If you'd lost a game, that was a horrible view. Take it the, was horrible. Take the wall. I didn't even see the bit. <laughs> take the wall if you win. And, and, and I, I thought, well, did you always go home after a football match? Did you, or did you go out and experience things and try and take things from a concert or a film or or meeting really interesting honestly, people honestly no and i'd be ashamed to say that but uh, i i must say i i led a monastic life and uh, uh, completely dedicated to what i did and uh, now i'm a bit scared to say that because people look at me think this guy is completely uh, <laughs> mad you know but uh, it was my passion and uh, i have interest in life in uh, but how uh, uh, my passion was to understand the world and how to, to get human beings better and understand them well. So I, I think as well, you know, that uh, human beings in general arrive uh, quite early in life at a very good level, but they don't move a lot after because we like to, to do what is easy and not what makes us better always, you know. And uh, that is quite an interesting conclusion because I have a long, long experience for having worked with people to try to for them to be at their best. And very few in life do absolutely everything to get to where as good as they can be, you know. And I, I believe that it happens more in individual sport than in team sports. Right. But they do absolutely everything in individual sports you have to. In team sports is a bit, uh, can make you a little bit comfortable, you know. Do you think, if I follow on that, that logic, did, did you get too comfortable at Arsenal then? I don't know. I, w I would be inclined to say no, but I'm uh, not, the, not uh, maybe too good a lawyer for myself. <laughs> and... Uh, I uh, don't have that feeling, but uh, maybe, maybe. You have not to rule it out, you know. You have first, first uh, it starts with yourself, you know, and uh, in life, and especially in competition, where it's a fight to get uh, to your best level. And uh, so I cannot rule it out. Because, because there are two ways of looking at it. Look, I'm not your lawyer either, but there are two ways of looking at it, I suppose, which is, you know, that... The, once the move to the Emirates happens, mm -hmm. you're very much having to balance the books yes. for Arsenal, which I'm guessing is a new skill in some ways, and therefore that is a challenge for you. But at the same time, your whole ethos is winning football matches. Yes. And also you've had adventures in different countries. Mm -hmm. Would you have been more satisfied? Would you have balanced that side of your character in Milan or Madrid or Barcelona? Well, I, I, I went in a different stage of my career because I, I thought I could win with Arsenal. And uh, you, you, you finished my first period, finished it at 2006, yeah. where you, we missed the, uh, to win the Champions League final. I think we were really unlucky because we played with 10 men in the final. That's absolutely... And we're still close to win it, you know. But that was... Uh, would have crowned this period 96 2006 2007 we moved into the new stadium and it's true that my obsession 
I pushed as well the club to build a new stadium. And my obsession was we needed to be as many times as possible in the Champions League. We needed to restrict our finances and we needed to sell our best players to pay the stadium back as well. So I was maybe uh, uh, happy when we achieved that. But on the other hand, if you look in Europe, there's not many clubs who stay 19 years on the trot in the Champions League and get out of a group stage. Uh, I think we were only two or three who had that consistency. So we were remarkably consistent. But as well, I agree with you, we didn't win the championship, but we could have done two or three times. And uh, uh, so I have to look at myself as well, yes. But you also described some of those years after the Invincibles as wonderful. It is wonderful because you do your job and you're not scared to lose anymore. You just go to a game. Sometimes I, I, I thought, why am I paid so much money to do this job? You know, <laughs> It is so simple. It is so easy. You just come, enjoy. The players owned the way we wanted to play. They had a, they had a kind of charisma. They refused to be mediocre. They did not accept to lose football games. And they owned, they owned that desire for perfection. And they stimulated each other. Once you get to that stage, the manager's job becomes very easy. And uh, so I must say, uh, I got praised the most where I suffered the least, you yeah. know. And I uh, got criticized the most where I worked the hardest in my career at Arsenal. But that's uh, the fact that uh, when you have the right players, you can win football games. And uh, when you have less good a team, uh, you do with less. And our job basically is to take the maximum out of the potential of the team. And also, I'm guessing that those years were wonderful at times because you were, goes back to what you said about talking to young people, you were developing young players and helping them reach their peak, which they then unfortunately took their talent, a lot of them then took their talents as well. Yes, because our, our job is to win football games and uh, develop a style of play. It is as well to influence people's life. And on the third level, it is uh, to develop the structure and the brand of a club on uh, worldwide, you know. And uh, overall, I believe uh, when I put all together, I did all the three, even being uh, critical, I think quite well. All the three together, only in moments of my career at Arsenal, because uh, to win every football game, to develop the individual players, and to develop the brand of a club when you build a stadium, all the three together is very difficult to do. But I did the three. And uh, what I, uh, I think uh, I did well, where I'm the most proud of, is I did not run away when it was difficult. And I, I wanted to guide the club through a sensitive period. And I went to the end of it. And uh, thinking, when I will leave, I will leave the club in a good financial position with a stadium that is basically not a burden anymore for the club and in good conditions, you know. And today the club can uh, take off again. But that's a huge personal cost to yourself. Yes, but uh, it's interesting as well, you know. It's not... Uh, honestly, uh, I'm quite proud of that because it's not only about glamour and uh, winning titles. It's important, of course, it's vital. But uh, now as well, other things in life that uh, are really important. It's what uh, what you leave behind you. Let me go back to 1998 then, back to what we were talking about and winning at Old Trafford. How much for you was that period, Arsenal against Manchester United, the late 90s? How much was there an element of you against Alex Ferguson? Well, there was a personal competition between him and me. There was a individual competition for in each position between an Arsenal player and the Man United player. But that's coming back to that, that it was war, you know. And in England, I, I noticed that coming from France, when the pressure is on, the English guy turns to war. Let's fight, you know. Yeah. Let's, yeah. So, so you had this individual preparation for 
my guys, it's you or me, you know, and uh, and Vati became always uh, the intensity and sometimes he got out a bit of uh, control and sometimes a lot out of control. But at the end of the day, once once a competition has gone, uh, like in many competitions, you have respect for each other. Did, did your intensity go up because their intensity went up? No, I'm a bad loser. And, and uh, so sometimes uh, I uh, have only to look at myself. I got out of control as well. Sometimes uh, I have been provoked, but uh, the week before the games, you know, that uh, the pressure is on and uh, every press conference is scrutinized and analyzed and every everything is analyzed. But it's part of, of, uh, of the enjoyment of a competition as well. So, so in, in that intense battle, because the, the late 90s and early 2000s, it really was United Arsenal every year. Um, were you, after you'd done your press conference, would you scrutinise what they were saying? And were you doing stuff in your press conference to, to try and wind them up? Yes, of course. You, you, you want to influence what uh, your opponent and you do not want to respond to the provocations from your opponent. And the press knows how to tease that, you know, and... Uh, it was part of, of the preparation as well, yeah. Um, the irony, actually, of doing this is I read Ferguson's leading book before I read <laughs> your book. I, I just happened to be reading that, and then I, I was doing this interview, and so I read yours. Um, I think the two of you are quite similar. Would you agree? Yes, I wouldn't disagree. And... Uh... I think as well we are the witness of our period, you know, of a, of a society, and uh, you you uh, we are a little bit the products of the evolution of the game. That means we were powerful inside our clubs. We had uh, uh, at the time we were made at the time where the influence was only one directional on the player, and the evolution has gone more multi-directional today. Uh, the manager is not only the, the, the only person who has an influence on the players. Sometimes the players have their own physio, their own dietitian, their own uh, doctor, yeah. and uh, so their, their agents, two or three agents around them. So they have their own social networks. So the influences on the players are multidirectional. And we were the products of a period where the manager was the main influence on the football player. Um when the pizza hit his head, after which was thrown by Cesc Fabregas, where, did you see that or did you not see that? I was a specialist at not seeing things. Yes, you were, so, yes, yes. Uh, I, uh, I didn't see it. I knew, I've been told who did it. Unfortunately, it landed on uh, Alex, but it was a bit Man United's fault because they put the pizzas in our dressing room, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... In hindsight, now today it's uh, it's funny. I can understand completely that Ferguson was not happy, but uh, I think after with a distance he laughed at it as well. But it was just to show how f how uh, the fight was big in the corridors, you know, at the time. Today you don't get away with that anymore. No, you, know? you don't. Do you? No chance today. You finish. Uh, in jail now. <laughs> yes, yeah. And it would have been filmed on social media it and it would, it would have been everyone. You know? um, the dressing room after that, that that was the end of the 49 match yes. on, on beat and run. So what do you, at the end of a 49 match on beat and run, and we'll come to the start of it in a minute, but at the end of it, what do you say in the dressing room after that? Because because that had a massive effect that defeat didn't it? That end of the run, you you think had a big effect on the. It was team. a huge effect because uh, suddenly you're down on earth yeah. again, and uh, we're up at the top of the Everest, and you say to the players, "Now let's get up again." They tell you, "Come on, leave us a little bit alone now," and uh, it, we had we took us time to recover, and uh, I think. Uh, uh, we won uh, the first game again at QPR 1-0 and we didn't deserve to win it because it took us four or five games to recover from it. Do you find it odd that a team that had gone 49 matches... I found it very odd. But uh, it's strange because when you are hit 
like that. Uh, suddenly uh, the connections go, the fluency of the game goes, and everything becomes difficult. Go back to the start of The Invincibles and the, and the start of, of the run. And you told the players they could go unbeaten for the season. But you'd done that the previous season as well. So why did you repeat it? That What was the thinking there? Because uh, I personally thought uh, to do the immaculate season, uh, I have done a good job and the players as well. And as long as you don't do that, somebody else could do better. So I wanted to say, I've done one year in my life, I've done the job, there's no room to do better. And I wanted as well uh, to, I, I, I think as a group of people, you need always a long-term target and a short-term target. And the long-term target was that's to give them uh, appetite to develop. You need uh, sometimes a target that is higher than the players would put it, you know. And they told me we didn't win because uh, you told us you want to... In 2003, they told me, well, I said, why didn't we not win? Uh, you, your target was too high, it's too much pressure. And stupidly, I said, I think you can do it. And uh, so sometimes it shows that uh, don't be scared to be ambitious. Sometimes it takes time. You put the seeds in some way in the brain and it takes time to get out. And uh, so overall, it allowed us as well, when we won the championship, to give me another motivation to the group. Don't lose a game now. You can become immortal now. Because there were five, five four, games. four games left. We nearly lost each of them, you know, but uh, we just managed because we had that desire to survive, but uh, uh, we didn't lose. But when they came to you and the previous season, they said, well, we lost, we lost because you put too much pressure on us. Mm -hmm. How much time do you then think about actually repeating it? Because there's every chance they could say straight this. Away, I said, straight away. Straight away. Straight away. I told them you can. I think it's Martin Keown who told me it was too much pressure to not do it. That doesn't surprise, doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, without any worry whatsoever for yes. you? Without any worry? Yes. Sometimes uh, uh, in our job, you know, it's important to be stubborn. I know that uh, when you're too stubborn, you can be stupid. But uh, as well, you have to be demanding and insistent on, uh, on many things in, in, in uh, your job. Um, what made that Invincibles team so great for you? First of all, uh, what makes every team great, first of all, is be good players in every single position. Uh, players who had a special charisma, you know, when you saw, when they came in in the morning, you could see these guys refused to be average, you know, they had, they carried something that uh, was special. And uh, the good understanding they had with each other, but I would say above all, uh, great quality. How do you, when you're recruiting, how do you recruit charisma? Because you've recruited some amazing, you, I mean, you have recruited some amazing players in your time, not just at, at Arsenal, you go back to, to George Weyer when you were, when you were yeah. at Monaco. So how do you as the manager delve into the personality of a player? Because that, that comes through as being crucial through all your great teams. I, I always look at uh, uh, some special quality, you know, I think one quality, uh, that is, you make your life with your dominant quality. None of us is everything, we, but uh, we need one quality that is dominant, and we need to be good at anything else. You know, okay. not special, but one. Uh, if you can can hang your hat on something, and after you look at the intelligence and the motivation of a guy, and uh, when you observe the way he plays football, because the the game is the best revelation of a character of a person. Because you have no social uh, uh, coverage anymore. Yeah. In the game, you become who you really are. You know? And by observing well the players, when he, what he does when his partners lose the ball, for example, I'll give you an example, uh, how much belief he has in what he does, how convinced he is, uh, how much he wants it, uh, 
So all these kind of things you can observe in the game and you know a lot about his character. So you, so you would in the main judge a player's character by what you'd seen him do on the football field rather than necessarily talking to a previous manager or academy coach or whatever it may be? In our job, it's difficult to get the truth. Right. You know, where sometimes people say it's good because they want you to fail or they say it's good because they want to sell the player. So you don't rely too much on that. You have to be a bit uh, uh, suspicious on the advice you get. Make your mind up and uh, uh, then uh, you have to accept as well that in football you make many decisions and you have to accept the insecurity and uh, the uncertainty of the decision you make, you know. And uh, basically what is difficult in our job is uh, every Friday we produce uh, jobless people and on Monday we employ them again and say, my friend, now I employ you again, let's show me the week that uh, on Friday you can do the job. And did that, does that eye to, to spot the player and the characteristics of a player on the field, that same eye, because you've, you also have, a, through, through many examples, have shifted a player's position during your career? Yes, because the positional play is, uh, has to be suited to your psychological profile and uh, to your physiological profile. You know? That means if you have no stamina, it's big, difficult to play central midfield. Uh, and uh, if you're very explosive and have uh, average stamina, you can play centre-back or centre-forward, you know. But uh, uh, if you're on the flanks today, you need a 400-metre runner, a guy who can run with high intensity and can repeat. So it has to be adjusted to his uh, physiological profile and as well uh, to, his, uh, to his psychological profile. It can make careers. I think, for example, uh, I believe that 90% of the players, their career depends on where they go at what and when. 10% can go anywhere. But, yeah, yeah. Being at, but, but being at the right place at the, at right, the right time point. with yeah. the right manager. Yes. Is there one player that you have managed that you think, thank goodness I got to manage him? 90% of them, you know. I was always happy to, to manage the players. And it's not necessarily linked with, with the talent. What you want is uh, you are not responsible for the talent you have. You are responsible for what you make of it. And I as, as much respect as a guy who had uh, an average talent but had uh, took the maximum out of it than a guy who was super talented because uh, super talent, uh, where does it doesn't come from? Uh, uh, it comes from your childhood or from birth, from genetical accidents. If you met you as a child sitting in that bistro with all the dreams of watching an FA Cup final on the television and so on and so forth, what would you say? What What would you say to that child, knowing the life that was ahead of him? I would ask him what do you want to do in life, and so he would have told me I want to be a farmer. <laughs> 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 Is that what you wanted? I couldn't imagine to spend my life in the game, you know. Football was not a serious job. Football was uh, something that you enjoyed on Saturday. Uh, its job is to work hard uh, physically and uh, go and uh, and uh, go in the fields. And I was happy there. The final quote that I'm going to get, because we, I could talk to you for another two hours, but we, we have to go. The final quote, which I've taken from your book, is... Um, when you meet God, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to end on a down, but you say, when I meet God and he'll ask me what meaning I gave my life, I'll say, I tried to win matches. And you worry that he'll reply, that's all. Is that all, yes. And, and uh, I will say, basically, look, it is not as easy as it looks from up here. And... Uh, down there, it was quite important. <laughs> <laughs> it's been an absolute joy talking to you. I'd love to shake your hand, but we can't in these times. But thank, thank, you, thank you very much for thank joining you. us.